Hello Internet, my name is Quinn and this is Blondie Hacks. Today I'm finishing up the 1950 Fleischmann Steam Toy restoration that I've been working on. We're going to fix up all the little accessories and we're going to run this thing on live Steam for the first time in, I don't know, decades? Who can say? Let's go. We left our steam engine running on air, but now I would like to get to work on this little line shaft that came with it originally. Someone's done some repairs on this at some point. There would have been a couple of stands that hold the ends of this shaft, and someone has replaced them with these bent wire contraptions, which honestly were kind of working okay, so kudos to the quick and dirty field repair there. But you can see this is one of the originals that's been broken off on the bottom. So I don't know exactly what these used to look like, but I can come up with some sort of rough replacement at least, something that's in the spirit of the originals. These are, of course, some sort of white metal casting, some sort of zinc alloy or pot metal. So I won't be able to create quite the level of detail that they had on them because I am going to machine them, but I'll at least keep the spirit alive. I took a few measurements, then went over to CAD and came up with this. I'll make a pair of these, one for each end of the line shaft. It's got threaded holes in the bottom that'll attach it to the base, and I think this should do the trick. It bears a passing resemblance to the original zinc casting anyway, and it will certainly get this thing functional once again. So I went through my brass scraps and I found this piece of bar stock that should suffice for making two of these little line shaft stands. As you might expect if you're a regular viewer, I of course start on the bandsaw, hack off a chunk of this. Now I'm going to be making two of these and I'm going to be making them end to end, similar to how you've seen me make a bunch of locomotive parts if you've been watching that series. I'll start by cleaning up the edges of it over here on the milling machine. Conveniently, that piece of bar that I started with is already the correct nominal thickness for the widest part of the parts, which is the base. The base is a little bit wider, and then the upper stand part, I decided I'll make it a little bit thinner, because I think it'll just look a little bit nicer. I want to make it look kind of like a casting. Then I'll do some edge finding. i got to find the center line of the piece, and I'm also going to edge find from each end. Similar to how you've seen me do before, I'm using my absolute scale on the DRO for a zero on one edge and the incremental scale for a zero on the other edge, and that gives me a reference for each of the two parts. The only critical dimension is the distance from the bottom of the part to this hole that I'm drilling now, which is the axle hole. As long as the two stands have the axle hole at the same height, then everything is going to work fine. And one thing that I learned while doing this process is that when working with these tin steam toys, you really have to kind of turn down your model engineer instincts. I'll talk more about that in a minute. The axle on this line shaft is a very strange dimension. It's 85 thousandths, which is not any kind of standard imperial metric or wire gauge dimension. So I don't know where they got this material or why it's that size, but it took me a couple of attempts to find a drill size that was a decent running fit on that. Seems like that'll work. Next, I'm going to center drill and pilot drill all of the filleted areas on the stands. If you look at the CAD model in the corner, you can see that essentially every corner on it has a little fillet, just because I thought that would look nice and it makes it look like a casting. So from this position in the vise, I can drill out all of those and create the fillets essentially ahead of time. And for some idiotic reason, I decided to pre-drill and then drill them out to an exact eighth inch dimension with an end mill plunged down through each one which was a complete waste of time. These don't need to be that accurate. Drilling them to an eighth inch would have been perfectly fine. I don't know why I did this, except that, like I said, model engineer instincts were high on this, and I learned as I went along that you gotta dial it back with these toys. With the fillets all bored out now, I can connect the dots on a couple of them to form the inner surfaces. There's kind of a triangle cut out in the middle of each of these stands. So I'm going to rough that in by milling out a T-shape in the center of that triangle. This is a quarter inch depth of cut full width on an eighth inch end mill in brass. So I'm pretty much at the limit of rigidity on this milling machine. I'm feeding very gently and carefully to keep it from chattering. But I am getting away with this. Then the same cuts on the other side, and there's my roughed-in filleted areas. 
I'm going to do the rest of this with layout. So I'm going to clean the piece up and blue it up. And I'm going to make you watch all of this because die cam is so satisfying. This is the best part of every project. Oh yeah, that's the stuff. Calm down. To lay out the ends, I turned up a little button on the lathe that'll fit in those holes. And I'll trace that to create the end radius that I want. None of these dimensions are critical, of course. I just want them to look nice and look roughly the same from stand to stand. Then I connected all of the tangents of these various filleted and rounded areas, and that gives me the outer and inner surfaces that we need to create for the final parts. For all of these angled and rounded areas, a person could set up a bunch of complicated rotary table situations, but I'm actually going to do it quite a bit simpler than that for these parts. I'm simply going to rough in the shape on the bandsaw, and I'm going to do the rest of this with filing. There's really no need to get out the rotary table and go to all that fuss for these little stands. It's going to be a lot less work to simply file everything to the layout lines. Rotary table setups are fun, and they can yield the most accurate results. And sometimes it is faster depending on the complexity of the part, but for something fairly straightforward like this, where final appearance is actually not very important, a little bit of filing is honestly quicker. So the big surfaces I did with hand filing because that was quick and easy. I did the tops of those pieces as well. For those inside triangular areas, however, that is a perfect job for the die filer. I have this kind of knife edge shaped file for my die filer, and this will be just the ticket for getting into the tight interiors of these stands to file those triangular areas out to the layout lines. Based on my comments over the years, I think people misunderstand the niche that this particular die filer fills. It's a very small machine and the files are all small and very fine toothed. So it's really not a bulk material removal machine. It's really more like a power needle filer. It's for getting into tight spaces and fine tuning surfaces, getting up close to layout lines with really good control, that kind of thing, while saving your fingers, essentially. So if I had tried to file the bigger outer surfaces of this with the die filer, I'd have been there all day. The big coarse hand files were actually faster for that than this machine. Now, maybe I could do some more serious material removal if I had coarse files for this machine, but I don't, so this is how I use it. But that turned out great. That was the perfect machine for that job. To round the ends now, since they're T-shaped, I'm going to make filing buttons, which, well, I did off camera. And I'm going to do it this way instead of using my end rounding fixture on my belt sander, which you've seen lots of. That's a really great tool. But for pieces like this where I can't swing them around without hitting some other piece of the component onto the belt, then uh, this works great. Filing buttons are really actually very satisfying to use. I kind of enjoy being forced to occasionally use them because they are really fun, actually. Not only are they fun, but with a little bit of care and practice, they yield excellent results. That's as good as I could probably do on the rotary table, honestly. Next up is to thin the upper part of the stand so that it's thinner than the base, because I just thought that would look nice and would also look more like a casting, more how they would have made a casting. I thinned out each side using this setup here. I had to place some musical clamps after this initial thinning. I had to move the clamp on the end so I could reach that area. I did the same thing on the other side, shimming up the thinner area that I had just done. And then I left a little area near the base to file into a fillet with a needle file. I actually don't have this fillet on my CAD drawing, you might have noticed. But as I was doing this, I realized it would be quite easy to make a fillet there, and it would look really nice. So I did. And off camera, I also drilled and tapped the mounting holes on the bottom. So these are not as detailed as the originals, but I'm pretty pleased with those. I think they'll certainly serve the task. And, uh, I don't know, I think they look okay. I'll bolt one in place for now, but I can't put the other one in place yet because I need to do a little bit of work on the line shaft itself. This base is also a little bit bent. It's got an oil can in it that I wasn't able to quite straighten, but... Anyway, back to the line shaft. These pulleys just slide off. They're a snug friction fit on there. 
And I need to take this apart because this shaft is quite bent. I noticed that when I was taking the original stand apart. So I decided, well, before I put it all back together, I should at least make some attempt to straighten this. I would have liked to replace it, as I said, but I wasn't able to source any kind of wire or rod that's this dimension. And it needs to fit through the original cast pulleys. So I just did my best to straighten that, and that'll have to do. Nothing on this whole toy is straight or square anyway, so anything I do will help. So I'll put the pulleys back on there now, and one of the pulleys is different. It has a blind hole in it, and that's clearly the one that's supposed to go on the end of the shaft to drive everything and helps retain the shaft. And this one is quite bent. The hub in the center of this casting is actually bent. If I put it on here and give it a whirl, you can see how much that wobbles. It's got quite a procession in it. So we can fix that over here on my small scale swing press. Didn't take much. These zinc or pot metal or whatever castings they are are very, very soft. Wasn't too difficult to straighten that out. Again, not perfect, but certainly sufficient. With everything assembled, the drag on the line shaft I decided is too high. It needs to be very free spinning because these little toy engines don't have much power. So I opened them up a little bit with a hand drill, and now that spins very freely. Because the base and the shaft are both warped, there needs to be lots of extra tolerance in everything. And that's true of everything on this machine. As I said, you got to turn off your model engineer instincts. These inexpensively manufactured toys essentially depend on extremely loose tolerances on everything. That's how they work. So you got to keep that in mind and don't try to build everything to too fine a standard or things just aren't going to work. Meanwhile, I took apart the rest of the accessories, tuned them up a little bit. They're actually all in pretty good shape. They just needed a little bit of straightening here and there. The ripsaw blade had come off of its zinc cast hub. So I put a little super glue on that and pushed it back in. And we're getting ready to give this thing a test. I made some belts out of glued up O-rings. These would have been originally those uh, coil spring belts, I imagine, but I don't have any of those. So some O-rings should do the trick. I mounted everything up to a wooden base so we can give things a try. Time to get some water in the boiler. This was the moment where I realized it's actually very, very difficult to know what the water level is in this boiler. It's not something I ever thought of because all my other boilers have water gauges on them. So if I was thinking ahead, I would have calculated the volume of this boiler and then measured how much water I was putting in it. But I didn't think of that until I was already pouring, so I didn't know how much was in it. I did figure out through some trial and error that a bamboo skewer makes a pretty good dip rod. You can stick it in there and you can see how much of it is wet. It has to be something like wood or bamboo. Nothing else really worked. You couldn't see where the water level on it was. Next up is fuel. The box that I got this thing in came with a bunch of these old SBIT tablets. So I will use these. Hopefully they still work. These things are probably 30 years old, but I assume they still work. They were very reticent to light, which might be a function of their age, but eventually it did light. Well, there she goes. It's steaming. It's making little noises just like it should. After three or four minutes, it was starting to sound like there might be some real steam in there. You can see the engine wants to go. It's trying. A little bit more. A little more steam. Oh, there it's go. There it goes. Almost. A little more. There it goes. It is running barely. There is really not a lot of pressure being built in that boiler right now. The engine is running, but just barely, and there's no load on it. If you look closely, you can see it in the video. There's a lot of steam coming out of the whistle. And I did some tests with tissue paper. The safety valve is not leaking or blowing off, but there's a lot of steam coming out of the whistle. So I was hoping that whistle was reasonably well sealed. In my tests with air, it seemed to hold 9 PSI, but, you know, steam changes everything. Temperature expands things and things shift, and I fiddled with the valve a bit, but I couldn't get that whistle to stop leaking quite badly. So it was costing us all our pressure, I think. I decided to pull it off and replace it with a bolt for now, and we'll see if we can get this engine to run better. So back in with a fresh tablet, and here we go. Another minute later, there it goes. That's how it should run. Look at that. That's a runner. 
Oh, there's nothing like live steam. This thing needs a governor. All right, let's get an accessory on there, see if it'll do some real work. Oh yeah, look at that. Oh, this thing wants to run. Actually, this is a good opportunity to sharpen up my new bamboo tungsten rods. These are a special tungsten design for TIG welding wood. I haven't tried them yet, but I'll put a little grind on them to give that a whirl later. This thing is turning out to be useful already in my shop. Let's try out the saw next. This is, I presume, a little dimensional lumber saw. It's for cutting 2x4s, 2x6s, that kind of thing from large rough cut sawmill boards. And look at that! <laughs> That's running like a champ! Does anybody need some tiny scale 2x4s? This thing has a line shaft for a reason. It's supposed to be able to run multiple tools at once. So let's see if we can get that to go. I'm skeptical of this because I can tell this thing is approaching the limits of its power. But I brought in the rip saw and it does work. So that's good. Our repairs have been successful on that at least. Let's get both of them hooked up at once. Ooh, yeah, it's really struggling. Does not want to run two of them at once. With a bunch more fiddling, I did get it to go. What I figured out was those ESPIT tablets do not have a lot of thermal energy in them. I don't know if they're all like that or if these ones are just really old and they've lost some potency or something, but uh, yeah, they just don't make enough heat to make enough power to really run all of these accessories at once. It can just barely run two of them and only when the tablet is fresh. When the tablet burns down about halfway, it just runs out of power and it can't run two of the accessories anymore. It'll still run one quite well, but Two is right at the limit of those tablets for their ability to make energy. It's definitely not going to run three accessories. Earlier in this series, I did a lot of speculating about how these toys were originally supposed to regulate their pressure, whether it was the safety valve or maybe the whistle was designed to leak. A lot of people said it was the port face on the cylinder that's the ultimate pressure release. All of that might be true, but honestly, now seeing this, I think the real answer now is that they just know that these ESPIT solid fuel tablets really can't build enough pressure to be dangerous. There's no way those tablets could make 60 PSI, which would be the danger point on this boiler. So I think that's really what's happening is there's no real risk from these toys because the heat source just isn't powerful enough. But it is powerful enough to have a lot of fun until they burn down. They don't last very long, I should say, and they are very smoky. I had to open the shop doors because it got pretty smoky in here, but it's a, it's a good couple of minutes of small town fun. You can still buy these tablets in Canada. I know they've been banned in a few countries lately, but we can still get them here, so I might give it another try sometime. I've burned up all the ones that I had, but it's great to see this thing in revenue service once again. A 1950s Fleischmann steam toy back on the shop floor getting work done. I hope you enjoyed this series. I really had a lot of fun playing with this thing. Thank you so much for watching, thanks to my patrons for making it happen, and I'll see you next time!